You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, goddammit! Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Yeah, give the kid a break. (laughs) Poor Vinny. Somebody needs to give him a break. Well, you know what, honey? That depends on if you spell it B-R-A-K-E or (laughs) B-R-E-A-K. You never know. You know, the English language is a fun little language to play with and cast spells upon you. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm here to cast some spells on you or cast some pearls before swine or or maybe give Vinny some pears. I don't know. Is that going to be pears as in P-E-A-R-S or P-A-I-R-S? Hmm. Wow. So many options. I think first thing I'll do is say hey to everybody. Hey there. Hi there. Ho there, y'all. It is a Freaker Friday. And uh, what if GMOs are making people people so sick so big pharma can sell us more medicine huh imagine that that's from the health ranger over here on twitter by the way thank you barman for tweeting me out i truly do appreciate it and guess what i am inching closer to that 500 stalker mark (laughs) i got 495 over here on twitter and apparently right now um Alec Baldwin is the big news. You got Alec Baldwin and you got the Jane Doe that said he did it, but then admitted that she didn't know him and doesn't put her much different from the other gal that said, I don't remember where it was or when it was or how it happened, but he did it. Yeah. Lord, people, get your story straight. I mean, it is a story after all, but if you're going to tell a story, stick with it. Stick with it. Oh, well. <sighs> so, over here on Twitter, yeah, a whole hell of a lot of, yay. Ooh, hey, somebody's on a big, great big lobster. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I probably ought to say what all you're listening on, in case you don't know what you're listening on. I'm on uh, reallibertymedia.com, channel 10, also on the RLM Spreaker channel. But if you are listening on Spreaker and you want to chit-chat with me, you can leave comments, but, hon, I won't see them. Come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Have some fun. Give me some static. I'll give it back. It's all good. Everybody else will jump in. They'll play monkey pile cybernetically, and we'll all just have grand old time. Also, I'm going out there on, uh, let's see, uh, rlmradio.xyz and the Real Liberty Media or the RLM TuneIn channel and the Internet Radio channel and lots of other other channels. (sighs) <sighs> I'm just going out on the cybernetic airwaves and messing with lots of people. You know, they say love spreads germs. Well, I'm infecting the world. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, well, moving along. Over here on this realliberty.org. Oh, God, I'm going to have to close Twitter because there's Michael Moore. He's just freaking scary. That's just all there is to it. Um, thank you, Grim. For letting everybody know over here on RLO that I am up and running. Well, okay, I'm on my backside. Mm, I had to pick a side. It was my backside. Basically because it's easier to broadcast than being upsy down. So, uh, over here on Freedoms Network, I see the lovely Estrella has been posting things like crazy. Grimmy is also over here as as well as Majutur Souts. And, um, yeah, the guy with all the consonants, he's here too. Hmm, global warming, climate change, and you know what? They can't find that stuff over on the EPA page anymore. It got taken down to update it, and it just plain hasn't come back yet. Ah, I wonder why. Hmm, why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? Well, because it was all false. Let's see, over here on Fakey Book, I see my sissy in law. Hey there, Donna. How you doing, sweetheart? Happy birthday, Alexis. 
beautiful young thing that she is. Let's see who else is. And it's Lance's birthday, too. Happy birthday, Lance. Uh, my dear sister Catherine is also posting like crazy over here. Other than that, not a whole heck of a lot going on on Fakey Book. Let's see, I've been to Twitter, been to RLO, been to F on site, been to Fake. Minds! Minds! What's going on over here on Minds? All kind of crazy ass shit. Yeah, winning big across the board. Mm hmm. If voting really made a difference, do you really think they'd let you do it? Really? I don't think so. Oh, well. And I see that there's some interesting news going on in Bitcoin as well. I, or at least some stuff that, you know, just little blurbs on Twitter. And it's like, what? What? Well, I don't have a dog in that race. So, or a pony. Or any of that. But, hey. Let's see. Scrolling along, scrolling along. Okay, I've hit all of the biggies over there. I suppose it's time for me to go over to that um, free node area. Yeah. Rabbit on the run. Grimmies. Ooh. Fluky. Rob works. What the hay? What the hay? <laughs> and Grimmies Putin. Grim, what the hell? No, Putin's over in Russia. Hun. Or not Grimmy Vinny. In any case, over here in the Real Liberty Media chat, where you need to be if you want to give me static, right up top I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, who is the RLM god. We also have the lovely Moose Girl logged in, and Grimmy and Moose are going to be on later on this evening for the Freakers Ball. That will be a good time had by all as well. I may even get to stay up for some of that, seeing as how I don't really have to go to work tomorrow, but I do have to go visit my mom. Hi, Kate, down in Florida. How you doing, hon? I also see a double dip in a Chalcedony. Well, it's a Chalcedony and a Chalcedony. Got a double dip going on, though. The lovely Soikles is also here, as well as Chloe. And getting touched by some cyborgian noodles, seen as how today is a Pastafarian holy day. Arg! That's a holy word for Pastafarians. Hi, cyborg noodle. Echelon is also here, as well as Gooberzilla, yours truly, as well as I be Don C. Meister Brower. We got a couple doses of the pox going on over here in the chat. Poxified and poxophone. We got some pompa pompa pon sauce also in here, as well. We're feeling saucy, for those of you that don't know. The lovely rain is also here, and they're projecting to have rain out here in my neck of the woods tomorrow. Yeah, I'll believe it when it starts leaking from the sky. I also see RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel, as well as Rob Works, who fired up that bubbler a little bit ago. Thank you ever so much, Rob Works. Truly do appreciate the cybernetic toke. Uh, looky there, Romes is here. Romes is a Roman, as well as Skittle. Hi, Skittle. So are you not f bominating anymore? What the hi? Did you turn in your f bominator crown? Oh, well. Vinny is also here. Hey, Vinny. Yeah, Vinny needs a break. Somebody needs to give Vinny a break. Darn it all. Phantom is also here as well as Asmo2. And looky there, Colfax101 is also logged in, but away at the moment. Dakota. Hi, Dakota. I haven't even checked the radar in like the last week or so uh, to see if you guys are getting nailed or anything, but did have an interesting gentleman stop in yesterday at work um, from South Dakota, and we had a very interesting conversation, and most of the topics, he was the one that brought it up, and I was like, holy shite. Wow. Someone that walked in and just kind of, boom, dropped all these truth bombs at me. How awesome was that? I also see Frumpy's here. Hi, Frumpy. How you doing? And looky there, Gromit is also here. Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is in the house, as well as JJ's 99, JJ's. Kozu is also logged in, as well as Moy, 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 Moy. Um... You had mines, but you can't find it? Aw, oh, bummer, dude. You know, I don't mind, and if you don't mind, it don't matter. That's why it's mind over matter. I also see Sock Puppet. Hi, Sock. 
Barman, barman, why'd you quit? Please, barman, don't go away. We might need beverages later. Oh, well, Sock's here. Sock will tend to it, I'm sure. Let's see, and over here in the red pill, let me go see who's over loitering over in the red pill as well. Um, over here, I see Ivy Don C and Barman, but it's not that Barman. It's a different Barman, apparently. Beth Z is also here, and so is Dakota and Echelon and F. Canelli, as well as yours truly. Grimner's also logged in, and Java Doctor 2. I see Juana Taco and Moosey, as well as QFTW. Um, our Lim Fluke is also over here, and so is Rob Works and Surly. Surly's got a lot of underscores, because I'm thinking that that means Surly could be all kind of different. Um, let's see. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Because Surly pretty much is in um, a descriptive anyway. So if you're Surly blank, fill in the blank, then wow. I could go all kind of places with that, but I won't. Uh, da -da, da -da. Lost your mind, Vinny? <sighs> I lost mine once. And then I found out where it was at. And now it's refusing to take all my calls. I hate when that happens. Oh, well. So, what's been going on today? You know, I've been in and out and in and out. You know, been kind of busy, tending to business. Been actually um, doing some some fun work at work. I've been refinishing a couple of pe pieces of uh, furniture. An antique wooden um, ironing board that I sanded down and clear coated and then um, an end table that we're redecorating a room and we're putting antique furniture in there so that's kind of fun and then uh, Monday I get to refinish a dresser so hey gonna be fun gonna be busy I like doing that kind of stuff the hands-on you know when you've done a, d a good job you can see it right in front of you that's the kind of stuff I like doing, so way better than sitting there poking a bunch of numbers and stuff in a computer <clears throat> for a living. That's, yeah, this is much better. Oh, hey, hey, there's people dancing. Oh, now they're gone. People were dancing over on mines, and now they're gone. Damn it. Hmm. Lots of people from Vietnam over here on mines, too, which is rather interesting, but I don't speak the language, so I guess I'm just kind of SOL. In any case, this is one that I saw a little bit ago over on Twitter. It's from the Twitchy team, and as soon as I saw this on the Twitchy thing and then refreshed, it's like everybody and their dog is jumping on this bandwagon. But holy shite, the woman who claimed Brett Kavanaugh raped her now says she made the whole thing up. Hmm, thanks for all of the BS that we have been inundated with, darling. The Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley has referred another one of Brett Kavanaugh's accusers to the FIBR FBI for possible criminal pro prosecution after she admitted to committee investigators that she made up allegations that Kavanaugh had raped her in a car. Thanks, biatch. There's an awful lot of women that that actually does happen to you and you just made life a lot more difficult for them. Thank you. Thank you. Seriously. May you get exactly what you put out. The blessings that you have earned. So, apparently this referral stems from an anonymous Jane Doe letter that the committee received in September that in graphic detail said Justice Kavanaugh had raped the letter writer and her friend several times each in the back of a car. At the same time, Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. Damn. Now, on September 25, 2018, staffers for Senator Harris, a committee member, referred an undated handwritten letter to the committee investigator that her California office had received, signed under the alias Jane Doe from Oceanside, California. Now, the letter contained highly graphic sexual assault accusations against Judge Kavanaugh. 
The anonymous accuser alleged that Justice Kavanaugh and a friend, oh, and a friend, had raped her several times in the backseat of a car. Oh, see, and I read that wrong because I thought, oh, he had, he had raped her and then raped a friend. I'd, I read that wrong. Oops. So, it goes on to say that they had raped her several times each in the backseat of the car. In addition to being from an anonymous accuser, the letter listed no return address. Hmm. Failed to provide any time frame and failed to provide any location beyond an automobile in which these alleged incidents took place, which is really not a whole hell of a lot different from What's Her Face that had a GoFundMe account. That's probably all of that money from that GoFundMe account is going to go to pay legal fees and settlements. Yeah, all of you people that donated to her, <laughs> you're paying for the settlement and her legal fees. Good on you. There you go. Good job. But the committee took the letter seriously anyway, you know, even though it could have just been written by some some guy in bumfucked Egypt for all they knew. And um, they even questioned Justice Kavanaugh under oath about the allegation because they were so serial about it. They were so serial, they were frosted flaky. They read him the letter in full as part of the questioning. In response to the anonymous allegations, Judge Kavanaugh unequivocally stated that the whole thing is ridiculous. Nothing ever, anything like that, nothing. The whole thing is just a crock, farce, uh, wrong, didn't happen, not anything close. And later that day, September 26, the committee publicly released the transcript of the interview with Justice Kavanaugh, which included the full text of the Jane Doe letter. Isn't that special? They pulled out all the stops referring with this shit, not referring to any of his rulings that he's made, just to some made-up shit. Because, well, it's all reality TV anyway, and it's very poor script writing, if you ask me. Because, trust me, people, reality TV, there are scripts. Yeah. If it doesn't cut the mustard, it gets cut. Yeah. Now, the committee received an email from one Judy Monroe Late, uh, yeah, Layton, who said that she was Jane Doe. Then on October 3rd of 2018, committee staff received the email from her with a subject line claiming, I am Jane Doe from Oceanside, California, that Kavanaugh raped. She uh, wrote that she was sharing with you the story of the night that Brett Kavanaugh and his friends sexually assaulted and raped me with his, in his car and referred to the letter that I sent Senator Kamala Harris on September 19th with details of this vicious assault. She continued that, I know that Jane Doe will get no media attention, but I am deathly afraid of revealing any information about myself or my family. She then included a typed version of the Jane Doe letter. But, supplies! Monroe Layton was a liar. Because the committee investigators began investigating her allegations, uh, given her relatively unique name, the committee investigators were able to use open source ser uh, research to locate her and determine that she, one, is a left-wing advocate, two, is decades older than Judge Kavanaugh, and three, lives in neither, or lives in neither the Washington, D.C. area nor California, but in Kentucky. Now, in order to investigate her sexual assault claims, the committee investigators first attempted to reach her by phone on October 3rd, but were unsuccessful. On October 29th, just in time for trick-or-treat, she pulled a trick, thought she's going to get a treat, and now she's screwed. Yeah, the investigators again attempted to contact, leaving a voicemail, and in response, she left the committee investigators a voicemail on November 1st. <sighs> then she admitted to the committee investigators that she made the whole thing up. Yeah. 
She just wanted to get attention. It was a tactic, and that was just a ploy. She told the committee investigator that she'd called Congress multiple times during the Kavanaugh hearing process, including prior to the time of Dr. Ford's allegations surfaced, to oppose his nomination and regarding the false sexual assault allegations she made via her email to the committee. Well, she said, I was angry and I sent it out. When asked by committee investigators whether she had even met Judge Kavanaugh, she replied, Oh, Lord, no. Yeah. Well, you know, and I'm sure she's going to say, I'm a victim because <laughs> they're holding me accountable for my own assholiness. Really, hun? Well, you know, you do something stupid like that, and yeah. Um. Ooh, Rob's going out for pizza. Pizza, pizza. Nom. Oh, dude, seriously. Seven fifty for that? Aunt some pizza. Although I'm probably going to do grilled cheese tonight for supper because I got a hankering for grilled cheese. I don't know why, but I do. Hmm. Well, like I said before, this nonsense, this shite, basically just made it a hell of a lot tougher for women and men that have actually been assaulted, that have actually been abused, makes it tougher for them to not only want to come forward, but when they do come forward, to be believed. Because you know what? I've been there. I've done that. And it's tough enough when it actually does happen to get them to believe you. It's tough enough. Even when there's actual freaking physical evidence. So, thanks, biatch. Thanks. <sighs> you know, people just freaking don't realize. And then when they get busted for their bullshittery, then it's like, oh, yeah. why are you picking on me? But, but, but I was mad. Oh, sorry, hon. Sorry. And yes, you are sorry. Oh, man. It's stuff like this that just makes me want to go up and just drop kick someone through the goalpost of life. But then I have to stop. And I have to realize that this is a very damaged individual already. And so I just send them prayers and just say, Oh, honey, bless your heart. May you receive what you give. That's pretty much about all I can do with that. About as charitable as I can be. Okay, cat. Stop chewing on the cord. My cat seems to think that the leash that's got me attached to the computer is now her plaything. Rascal, it is not your toy. It's my toy. Goofy cat. <sighs> Thanks for nothing, toots. Okay. Now, I'm going to... If Michael Moore shows up one more time, I'm going to close Twitter because it's like, oh my God, that's just gross. Um, okay, moving along. I am closing Twitter too because it's like, no, nah, mm, can't go there. Can't go there. Okay. Uh, where's my pocket? There it is. I put lots of things in my pocket. Oh, before I get there, before I get there. So, you know, the stories and the nonsense, the, the distraction with that whole Kavanaugh bullshit, which was basically keep you distracted with this bullshit that has even worse repercussions than uh, a lot of people realize while ignoring what was actually going on, which, oh, let's not pay attention to how he's ruled on things. But, 
Yeah, so we've had the collapse of that nonsense. There's all kinds of other collapses going on as well. But apparently, over here on ZeroHedge.com, crudes collapse and the C word. Yeah, let's just pretend this isn't happening again. So why aren't more people talking about this? It's a huge development in area peep anywhere. The mainstream media, a.k.a. corporate lame-ass propaganda system, with baited expectation for 3% wage growth on payroll Friday, yeah, all eyes are on the labor market, which is l a lagging indication instead of the oil market, which is forward-looking. Oh, really? So, as of this writing, the futures curve of WTI has expanded this current sell-off, and the level of alarming... Contago, what does that mean? I have no idea. Alarming Contago has continued to widen in both amplitude as well as frequency in just the past few days. So, the question at the front was rhetorical. The reason everyone wishes to focus on the labor report is obvious. The wage data is particularly outwardly, though misleadingly, conforms with the idea of an economic boom, at least in the U.S. But the crude market isn't just saying, wait a minute. It completely refutes that very thing. Furthermore, the oil curve had only been in a backward backwardation less than a year, and it flipped forward um, that positive economic signal, which was widely covered exactly one year ago today. So, we've seen all this before. The oil curve shifted to Contago last on uh, November 20th, 2014, and it was ignored then, too. And after catching some reluctant notice, immediately dismissed as a supply glut in favor of data showing that the best jobs market in decades. Now, the payroll reports four years ago were just too lovely to set aside for this impossible, according to economists, ugliness. So get, guess which one proved more valuable in assessing the way the global economy is headed? Mm, I'm not real sure, but you know what? You guys have got me all these freaking graphs. I don't, yeah. Apparently that too was rhetorical exercise. So, expect to hear about another supply glut and OPEC and some such when conventional finally, or when convention finally does address another futures curve leaning the wrong way. And then we will hear about how unexpected everything will be when the labor market data proves irrelevant. Hmm. So, okay, whatever. I'm just seeing, I noticed myself in the last few days that gasoline prices have dropped 11 cents out here. Not all at once. They've been a, like every other day. Gasoline prices have gone down. So, um, let's copy this. Later, Vinny. Enjoy your dinner, hon. Um, can't go, can't -a go, can't -a antagonist, can't. Um, okay, I probably pronounced it wrong, Graham. Uh, let me see here. Contango, Contango, C O N T A N G O. Whatever the hell that is. I'll bet you if I click on it, it probably won't tell me. <laughs> oh, wait. Wait. What? Caught black oil term means turmoil. Oh. 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 Okay. Well, I clicked on the word, and and this is what it gave me. So I'll give that. Give that to you, too. And then I'll go back because I need to have that link for later. Um, it's happening again. You know, and, um, 
it really would be very, very wonderful, very, very nice if we did not <clears throat> have everything uh, wrapped up in oil. You know, if, if you know, well, that's national security. The petrodollar. National security. But, yeah. It would be nice if it wasn't. But it still is. And so, yeah. There are people out there creating all kinds or discovering, not necessarily. Well, some of them are creating. And some are discovering. Some are figuring out, which is pretty freaking awesome. But uh, I'm enjoying the lower fuel prices for now. So, got that over here on the FN site as well. Let me put it over here on RLO. Um, thanks, Zero Hedge, for writing an article that I understood very little of it, but that's okay. Okay. There, yeah, I'll just put something's crashing. I don't understand it. I don't pay attention to the stock market. I've had people ask me for stock market advice, and it's like, I ain't putting my money anywhere where I can't tangibly touch it. Sorry. I needed a drink. You know, I'm just, I'm I'm kind of hateful like that. If I can't hold on to it, then I don't trust somebody else to hold on to it. Um, that's right. National screwity. There you go, Grim. That pretty much defines it right there. Um, dun, 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 dun. Oh, a cog. Well, yeah, it's a cog in the wheel, too. Okay. Now, now I'm going to go to my pocket. Because I did throw some really awesome stuff in here. Um, and, you know, seeing as how we're talking about the stock market and that kind of stuff, this is one I do kind of sort of understand. And, well, okay. I just saw who was getting nailed and I went, yes! This is from um, althealthworks.com. Biggest destruction of market capital in its home country's history? Well, <laughs> Bayer stock takes a nosedive after Monsanto cancer verdict is upheld. Ah. Well, as far as major chemical conglomerates go, it's hard to top the newly formed Bayer Monsanto mega corporation in terms of sheer size and market control. Now, at the time of their merger, the two companies, now under the Bayer and Bayer Crop Science umbrellas, were expected to own more than 25% of the world's global seeds and pesticide market. Now, the sheer size and power of the new company led an activist push for it to be considered a monopoly. But the merger got the thumbs up from the antitrust regulators anyway. Why? Because the antitrust regulators got paid off. You just can't trust them. Duh. Antitrust. They just didn't put worthy on the end of it. It, it, it was a typo. Now, after skating by largely on the strength of its name and its connections in the world of government and business, the newly formed Bayer Corporation seemed to be on solid ground. Seemed to be. But now, many investigators aren't so sure if its immediate financial future after what um, what's being called one of the biggest losses in German stock market history. Ah, Apparently, after some initial confusion, a federal judge upheld a landmark cancer verdict recently for Dwayne Johnson, the terminally ill groundskeeper from California, and although his original punitive award was slashed from $200 million to $39 million, the verdict was significant in a multitude of ways, most notably because it an established um, because of its establishment of glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, as being carcinogenic in humans, yet again in a major court decision. 
The World Health Organization's IARC originally called it a probable human carcinogen in the spring of 2015. But it also has taken a huge chunk out of Bayer's bottom line, which could take an even bigger hit thanks to eight to 9,000 similar cancer lawsuits still pending in court. As noted in this report from the Organic Consumers Association, and there is a link to this. Now, the once promising Monsatan acquisition is now being seen as a liability by scores of investors. And the damage is already done on a massive scale. A cold, according to Holger uh, Jopspitz, okay, Holger, we'll just say that, who is a German financial analyst, Bayer may have just experienced the largest destruction of market capitalization in German stock market history. Now, as of a result of the Monsatan acquisition, estimating that Bayer's losses in recent months have already hit about 57.7 billion euros, or 65.8 billion, that's with a B, in U.S. dollars so far. So in total, the company's losses due to the thousands of lawsuits pending could end up in the 800 billion, with a B, range when it's all said and done. Can I get a collective, aww, oh, don't go there. Don't go there. I'm not I'm not going to try and talk you guys into fibbing. Don't don't do it. Don't do it. Now, the future of Monsanto Bear Corporation Behemoth remains hazy. So, what does the future hold? Well, for starters, more toxic chemicals are on the way, as a leaked investor report recently revealed a tentative new five-step plan to poison our food with even more toxic chemicals than GMO seeds. Well, ain't that just special? Hold your what? Um, oh, that's how they got Roundup passed in the first place. Rob Works was they had, um, who was that? It was Rummy, actually. I believe it was Rumsfeld. That, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oops. Back to the article. So, in Crevecourt, Missouri, where former Monsatan headquarters rests, Bayer recently put up signs for its newly enhanced multi-billion dollar American GMO division, which could mean the unleashing of dozens of new unlabeled GMO crops on unsuspecting Americans. So in other words, it's business as usual for the newest incarnation of what many activists have dubbed the most evil company in the world. Only this time, the German agricultural and pharmaceutical giant is the one calling the shots and taking all the heat from people who simply want to re want a return of the pre-World War II farming system of putting the health of people and the land first. Oh, well, huh? Yeah, you know, if you try, if you keep the land healthy, then the land will keep you healthy. So, with so much work required to make homegrown organic food more available and affordable in the United States, which is up to 80% of organic food on grocery store shelves, is imported, according to one recent report, and uh, it's clear that we have a long way to go to create a food system that works in the best interests of all people. Now, Bayer and Monsanto will be a major player in the foreseeable future, unless these hit home quick, my thinking. But thanks to the courage of truth speakers like Johnson and many others, it looks as if the battle for the heart and soul of America's food system it's not going to be one without major headaches and financial casualties for the new megacorp, to say the very least. So, I think that, yeah, this would be absolutely awesome if it took them down. Just took them down. The only problem is Bayer is the uh, one remaining biggie 
from the and ah uh, you know what I'm gonna have to see if I can't da, 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 da. okay let me do no I don't um. let's see um World War, oops, World War II. I'm going to see if I can't do a search real quick. Um, okay. Bayer AG is a German multinational pharmaceutical and life sciences company. Um, let's see. There we go. The history of Bayer is a, uh, um, let's see. It was a World War II Nazi Germany, and it was I.G. Farben, or Bayer, and it got broke up into multiple. Let's see. Well, that's from Bayer itself. We don't want to go there, because they're, are they really going to tell the truth? So this is from sourcewatch.org. Um, let's see. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. World War II and IG Farben. So it was in World War II Nazi Germany that IG Farben, or Bayer, entered into its most sinister phase as the leading chemical company in Nazi Germany. Now, IG Farben took over chemical plants across occupied Europe and the company used slave labor in their factories and even operated their own concentration camp. There the company conducted medical experiments on inmates and manufactured poison gases used to kill thousands. At the end of the war the 1945 Potsdam Agreement called for its dismantling of IG Farben into its constituent companies. Twelve IG Farben employees and directors were jailed for war crimes at the Nuremberg trials, and Bayer was reestablished as Farben Fabriken Bayer AG in 1951. It changed its name to the current Bayer AG in 1972, although the company is a different legal entity to IG Farben and is and its founding companies, a direct line of con continuity can be traced to personnel, infrastructure, and technology of all three incarnations. So, yay! Yeah. Um, apparently, they also, Bayer had close association with other German chemical companies, including BASF. Hmm. So, I'll go ahead and share this bad boy with you, too. Yeah, Bayer has a long history of not necessarily being the nicest company in the world. But, hey, we've got Bayer aspirin for your baby, Bayer baby aspirin. What the hell? What the hell? Um... Oh, huh. Imagine that, Rob Works. Okay, let me get the, uh, the other one, the AG Farben. Yeah, let's get this one shared to a couple other places. I, th I think it's only right that they deal with the repercussions of what they've put out there. And, you know, it really wouldn't surprise me if you dug far enough back. You'd probably find some connections between Bayer and Monsatan anyway. If you dug far enough back. I'm thinking it's pretty freaking awesome that they took a douche in the stock market. Um, oh, oh, 
Wow, Rob works. He shared a thing from the trenches. Ted Gunderson, former FBI chief, said most terror attacks are committed by our CIA and FBI. Hmm. Why does that not surprise me? It really doesn't. Rob is sharing some awesome links over in Real Liberty Media uh, chat. Y'all need to go over there and check it out. He's also sharing them over here on realliberty.org. So, yeah, come on over and check this stuff out. Oh, these people are just nasty. Okay, and then, since I got that, I'm going to go ahead and share the the history one as well over there. And I'll, I'll include that link in my blog as well, Grimmy, just so people can do their own research. I mean, just because I put it out here on the radio doesn't necessarily mean that I know what the hell I'm talking about. You know? I'm just going off of links I find on the internet, and we all know that everything you find on the internet must be true, because it was on the internet. Oh, wow. Distraction! I just looked out my window, and God, gorgeous sunset. My sky is all purple and orange. It's beautiful. Because I got clouds and sunshine. It's very pretty. History lesson. I'll put that over here on the effing site too. Just because I think people need to... People need to, to do this stuff. They need to be doing their own research. Finding this shit out. I will, I will plant seeds. I will lead the way on some of the stuff. But yeah. Y'all need to go to the effort of reading it yourself too. Yes. Becky, Becky, I am is here. Hi, Becky, Becky, Becky. Yay! Um. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Obama heckled in Florida. Oh, how funny. <laughs> <laughs> I actually watched um, a body language video of uh, the gal was, you know, talking about while Obama was doing a, a stumping speech. And yeah, apparently he's not nearly as elf confident as he used to be. Hmm. Imagine that. Um, basically, what she said in that video was that. Uh, the way he's acting, he's already got his tickets bought just in case things don't go well. <laughs> Which I thought, that's just too funny. I'm going to have to go there now. Do they have a video? Yeah, they have. Oh, it's video. Okay. I'll have to check that out later. Thanks, Rob. Are you the one that did Rob post that? Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Back to my pocket. Because I do have a few other things that are not necessarily cranky. Here's one. Here's one that I think is a booyah. I really do. I think people are getting their comeuppance with this one. It's from allitsinteresting.com. Indian park rangers, and that's like over there by Pakistan. Those kind of Indian park rangers. Um, shoot poachers on site. And they reduced the rhino poaching to almost zero. Now, it was originally published in February of 2017 and updated on October 20 or October 16th of this year. Now, the shoot on site policy at India's Kaziranga National Park saw more poachers killed by guards than rhinos killed by poachers in 2015. Booyah! Thanks to the cost of rhino horns on the illegal black market, rhino numbers are plummeting throughout Africa and Southeast Asia. However, the rhinos at Kaziranga, which is a nat national park in northeast India, are thriving. Now, a new BBC feature investigation has found that this is thanks to the park's controversial standing orders to kill poachers caught in the park. An aggressive policy that may be as effective as it is bloody. Park rangers shot more than 20 poachers in 2015, 
thus killing more poachers than poachers killed rhinos for the year. National park officials allow park rangers to shoot on sight if they come across any of them. Now, according to courts, the Forest Department in India has always been a militarized service. With park rangers wearing uniform style khakis, carrying guns and gadgets such as drones, and having the authority to prosecute any offenders. Now, the government defends this policy by pointing out that local crime syndicates are frequently involved in the illegal wildlife trade and escalate the situation in ways that could cost lives. Still, the BBC accuses the park rangers of carrying out extrajudicial killings when governmental authorities kill people without any judicial process or legal proceeding involved. Well, you know, sometimes a bullet can save an awful lot in the long run. I know, I shouldn't be saying that, but I'm saying it anyway. Because I'm sure there's someone out there that's, you shouldn't talk like that. Well, you know what? You live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, without due process in place, things can quickly spiral out of control. And the BBC thus cites critics who say that the need to protect endangered species is conflicting with the rights of people who eke out a survival around the national parks. You can eke out a survival without taking out other critters, dude, especially when taking out those other critters is deemed illegal. I mean, if we're going to have legal shit, if you are committing a crime and that is the consequence of the crime, and you still, knowingly, knowing that that is the probable consequence of the crime you're about to commit, don't you think that's kind of on you? Now, groups such as Survival International, which was featured by the BBC, say that good intention conversa or conservation projects often deny and undermine indigenous rights across the globe. There is a historical context for this as well. Many of India's national parks have a colonial legacy, with government authorities preserving the forest for the elites who ran the former British colony. Now, these land use distinctions did not consider the rights of the people who were already living there. A 2008 piece of legislation known colloquially as the Forest Rights Act sought to rectify this by restoring individual and community rights to land use, land use based on historical evidence. However, some say that Kaziranga's shoot on site orders have violated this edict. Well, if you're coming in there poaching, I'm having a hard time feeling sorry for people that are poachers and they kill these critters just for their horn. I'm having a hard time feeling sorry for them. Oh. What? Oh, Donna, you know Becky? Sweet! Yay, how awesome is that? Okay. So. Um, dun, 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 and Grimmy just dropped out again. Okay. So, let me put this over here on the and site and on realliberty.org and then I will move along. I know everybody says you need to go through the court system yada 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 but damn like I said I'm having a hard time feeling bad for these people. I really am. I'm thinking you, you get what you put out. Okay. Yes, I keep seeing flashing. Do what? What? 
Hey. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Some bitch. <laughs> I thought for sure I got it. Um, let me put this over here. Did I put it over here? I already did. Um, put it in the RLO. <sighs> this is where it would be nice to have two of me. <laughs> And then again, no, because then I would argue with myself. So, ooh, in Montana, wow, that's that's cold area there, Donna. That's very cold area up there. Okay. Okay. Let me go back to my pocket. Because now, I have something else that um, I think is quite awesome sauce. This is from Wired.com. And apparently, a mushroom extract might save bees from the killer virus. Yay! So, the bees, as you've probably heard, are dying in massive numbers. Termed colony collapse disorder, the die-off counts among its causes a parasite aptly named Varroa destructor, which is a flat, button-shaped, eight-legged critter no more than two millimeters long. They are mites that invade honeybee hives around the world in droves and latch onto their inhabitants and feed on their tissues, transmitting devastating RNA viruses in the process. Now, the worst of these diseases is deformed wing virus, believed to be one of the largest contributors to the devastation um, of honeybees worldwide. Named for the shrunken and misshapen wings that develop in affected, affected bees. DWV robs its host of flight, undermines their immune system, and halves their lifespan. And the sicker a bee is, the more useless um, its wings, and the fewer plants it pollinates. What's more, what flora um, an infected bee does manage to visit becomes tainted by the virus, transmitting the infection to future pollinators. Wow, this is bad juju. So as if a bee debilitating virus transmitted by itty bitty parasites wasn't terrifying enough, beekeepers currently possess no effective means of battling the virus. But a study recounted today in Nature Scientific Reports, which this date is October the 4th of this year, uh, researchers present evidence for a surprising solution to the DWV. Mushrooms. Shrooms. Now the discovery has implications not just for honeybee populations but also for the food systems, economies, and ecosystems that rely on their healthy activity. The mushrooms in question um, belong to the uh, gen uh, genera fo uh, fomes and Ganoderma, better known to fungus fans as Amadou and Reishi. Oh, cool! Reishi mushrooms. Cool! Now, the former commonly grown on trees in the shape of a horse's hoof, and the latter have long been prized in traditional medicine circles and are a common sight at Asian markets and health food stores. Both belong to an order of fungi known as polypores, and extracts which have been uh, shown in numerous studies to possess potent antiviral properties against dangerous infections like swine flu, pox viruses, and HIV. 
So they wanted to see if those extracts had a similar antiviral effect on bees. That's from Paul Stamets, who's the study's lead author. And um, he's also the author of Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms and is a passionate proselytizer of all things fungal. Apparently he also has a TED Talk, Six Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World which a lot of people don't realize this, but you have the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and the fungus kingdom, or the mushroom, because, yeah, it is a distinct kingdom all to itself. Now, Stamets has long suspected that bees derive their benefit from mushrooms. He recalls a scene in his backyard in July of 1984, the first time he noticed bees from his personal hive flying back and forth to a pile of fungus-coated wood chips. The bees, he says, were sipping droplets of liquid that had oozed from the mushrooms, uh, mycelium, 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 is that how you say that? Which is the fuzzy white network of cobby-webby filaments through which fungi absorb nutrients. Now, at the time, he figured the droplets contained sugar because fungi break down wood into glucose. But then a few years ago, I had an epiphany, a waking dream, actually. What if the bees are getting more than a shot of sugar? And he began to wonder if they were, in fact, self-medicating. Now, that question led him to Walter Shepard who's the chair of Etymolo entomology department at Washington State University and one of the world's leading experts on bees. Now, with the help of researchers in Shepherd's Lab and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, they have spent the past several years dosing sugar water feeders with extracts from mycelium of various species of mushrooms and analyzing the effect on infected bees. In both indoor experiments and outdoor field tests, bees that fed on mycelium extracts fared significantly better than those that drank only sugar water. In caged bees infected with DWV, the researchers obso observed an 800-fold decrease in virus, which is the measure of the level of virus in the bees, in the bees system. So... And among bees, that was among the bees dosed with amad amadou extract. Say this right. Now, the effect was less powerful in the field, which are less strictly controlled in lab trials. And colonies fed reishi extract saw a 79-fold reduction in DWV. Those fed amadou extract a 44-fold reduction. But the results were still highly significant. And in other field tests, bees fed reishi extract saw a remarkable 45,000-fold reduction in Lake Sinai virus, which is another disease ravaging honeybee populations. So it's shown a strong effect, stronger than anything I've seen. That's from geneticist, uh, yeah, Jay Evans, who's the head of the USD. USDA's Bees Research Laboratory. And um, Jay also analyzed the virus levels. Stronger even than RNA interference, another promising but expensive approach to fighting bee viruses that Evans himself is investigating. He said, I'm a little jealous, but... Um, Stamets has received numerous patents on the extracts in the past year, and he plans to sell them on his website, fungi.com, which is a domain he says he's owned since 1994. I'm not in this for the money, he says. I walk my talk, and I use my business to fund further research. Now, more studies are always a good idea, especially for something as seemingly effective as these extracts. For one thing, it's not clear whether they will help rescue bee colonies long term. Stamets field uh, studies have taken place over two months and in the summertime, but the hardest time of the year for bees is winter. Future studies will need to examine how other colonies fed the extracts fare over the six months or more and how many survive that cold and deadly season. 
It's also not clear how these extracts reduce the virus um, titers in the infected bees. I think that's how you say that. If it's not, uh, it's another word that I say wrong. Now they could be boosting the bug's immune system or inhibiting the virus directly or affecting the way it replicates inside the bees or it could be something else. Whatever the mechanism, it'd be useful to understand it more fully before deploying the extracts on a wider scale. After all, there are also unforeseen consequences to consider. So whenever I hear about something like this, I immediately think of risks and drawbacks. That's from Lena Wilfert, who's an env um, evolutionary ecologist at the University of Ulm in Germany. And she studies the spread of viruses among honeybees. Of the known viral pathogens affecting the insects, she says that DWV poses the greatest threat of all. So she appreciates the potential benefits of powerful virus nerfing agents. But anytime you apply a medication at large scale, you're going to have potential for resistance evolution in the thing it targets. Those questions have yet to be probed. We have to prove all of this. And thankfully, I've become more disciplined as a scientist being around other scientists, said Stamets, who acknowledges that there's much more work to be done and we're doing tests right now in several hundred more beehives. We are ramping up. So yay, yay, Mother Nature comes up with something to help Mother Nature. Maybe Mother Nature had something to help Mother Nature all along, and we're just finally noticing it. Enjoy your pizza, Rob! And Becky's back! Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Let me, I put that there. Let me put it over here on the effing site. This really is awesome news though to me. Saving the honeybees. There's uh, someone that lives about 60 miles from me where I get most of my honey from. So I hope he doesn't have to deal with this. And if he does, I'm going to have to remember <laughs> next time I buy honey from him that, uh, sweetie, look, this is awesome. Just in case. You know, you might want to check into growing some shrooms for your bees. We'll do a couple of bees on this one. Okay. Shrooms. <laughs> wow. It just amazes me. And I'm I am not a real mushroom fan. But I'm, I have learned to acquire a taste for some. I'm still not a great big consumer of them, but hey. Okay. There we go. We'll just do that. Okay. Hi, Bobby, over here on RealLiberty.org, which I didn't say hey to everybody. Becky Haynes is over here. Bobby, Soikles, Rob Works, Grimner, Mental Pancakes, and Terry Sanders just left a little bit ago. Okay. Let me go back to my pocket. I do have some, some good things in here because we do need to have some good things. But I also have some things that are not so good. So uh, let's go with. I think I'll go with another good one, just because I'm I'm feeling up today. I actually have a couple of them. That this is from InvestmentWatchBlog.com. Six reasons to start homeschooling ASAP. So, millions of American parents are now schooling their offspring at home, and new computer software is making quality home education easier to accomplish. 
Recent studies have shown that homeschooled students are superior to schooled students both academically and socially. And it shouldn't surprise you that homeschooled students do so well. In school, all students are expected, cookie cutter style, to learn the same way and at the same pace. Whereas at home, learning is individualized and self-paced, as all learning should be. That is from Saving Our Children and Families from the Torment of Adolescence, uh, which was written by Dr. or Robert Epstein, Ph.D. So, plenty of young people become well-educated by their parents and through their own efforts despite going to public school. But you can make the results even more dramatic by removing your children from these harmful institutions. And tomorrow we'll dive into creative ways to homeschool or unschool if you think the logistics are impossible for your situation. Which I do remember seeing something about, um, I saw an article about homeschooling um, and keeping your job as well. So, but I didn't save the link. I should have. <laughs> Oops. Now, today let's focus on why children and teens need to be rescued from public schools. Number one, freedom makes people smarter. Yeah. Oh, I got a sneeze. Oh, I hate when that happens. I feel one coming and it's just not... Mm. Oh, bless me. Holy smokes. So... A study on rats found that when they are given enriched environments to explore, their brains physically grow, and the rats displayed better problem-solving skills. They didn't have to be forced to interact with their environment. They were naturally curious. Doesn't make sense to push your children towards particular things that you want them to learn or that public schools say they should learn. Instead of signing them up for piano lessons, for example, put a piano in their environment. If they express an interest, offer to get them help and instruction. Now the Sudbury School in Farmington, Massachusetts has a 50-year history of teaching students in this way. They have a beautiful sprawling campus with a pond, woods, and fields, and they have books to read and games to play and sports equipment and kitchens for cooking and labs for experiments, and they have teachers available so that when the kids do want help learning or creating, they get it. But students plan their own days. They're not forced to study anything in particular. And with such a history, the school has amassed piles of anecdotal evidence on the results. It suggests simply giving children the freedom to pursue their own intellectual activities makes them more self-assured, more successful, and happier in childhood and in later life. Number two, at school they are indoctrinated by strangers. School is not about knowledge or intelligence, it's about obedience. It trains youth to be obedient to authority figures and to seek their approval. Basically, it trains them for, for, um, oh, I have a rocket in my pocket. Yeehaw! <laughs> Going jingle, jingle, jingle. Okay, um, yeah, they are most definitely indoctrination centers, educraption centers. Feed you lots of crap and expect you to regurgitate it looking the same as it was fed. And that's just not possible. Just not possible. Unless you swallow it whole and then, and that's, oh, that sounds painful. So this goes on to say, Many teachers are wonderful people, but even the greatest teachers are restrained by the system. My mom was a fifth grade teacher for almost 20 years, but she retired early because the administration grew increasingly insane. When she tried to give the students more freedom to learn what they wanted, she was scolded that the objectives are not clear. And if she didn't keep Soviet-style control over the schools, she was told to crack down. Why do they call it Soviet-style control? I would say more American-style control, actually, but 
Eh, I haven't experienced Soviet-style control, so I really can't say. Now, she didn't send enough kids to the office for discipline, apparently. And when she did, it was, why can't you solve these problems without the administration? In other words, administration wants to be there to push some papers around and push you around, but they don't really have to do the heavy lifting, you know? Now, this all was in stark contrast to her first years of teaching in the late 90s and early 2000s. And this was at a school in Massachusetts, said to be one of the top performing states in public education. That depends on what your definition of performing is, what kind of act you're putting on, I'm thinking. Now, of course, I have a high opinion of my mother, but, and I actually, me myself, do as well. My mom, my mom taught school until, um, I think, the brother just older than me. Once she had four at home, she decided, I got enough to teach at home. But she taught elementary school, um, and she actually taught my grand several of her grandchildren how to read and write so yeah um, back to this though even ma or even this writer's mom was not allowed to be a good teacher because the system doesn't want good teachers they want teachers obedient to the whims of the administration who in turn enforce obedience on the students now, apparently, they recently recorded a video where they discussed many of these themes along with uh, this author's sister who homeschools her children. And there is a link to this attached in it. Number three, at home, they are less exposed to troublemakers. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to keep your kids away from the riffraff. But in the real world, they'll have to deal with it. So, really? I don't see it. This isn't a matter of sheltering your kids so that they don't understand that there is evil in the world. It's a matter of teaching kids that they don't have to associate with bullies. But it's not just bullies. It is the other students who conform to the teen culture, which is spreading like cancer throughout the world. There has been a teen culture since there has been teenagers. That's nothing new. The way the culture moves may be something new, but there has been a teen culture since forever, just because they're teenagers. Now, in school, young people are surrounded by peers who sometimes exert unbearable pressure on them to conform to bizarre standards and who are often organized into stifling cliques. At home, young people have meaningful contact with better role models. Hmm. So rest assured that your offspring will naturally be exposed to enough terrible people in life to learn how to cope. You don't need to exacerbate this with the public education system. Number four, age segregation is harmful. And I got to agree with that one. Man, I had older siblings that helped me with schoolwork. I helped younger siblings with schoolwork. We all did our homework at the kitchen table while mom was fixing supper. And mom would help as well. It was a family time. So, yeah, I segregating them into ages can... Oh, well, this says it is only quite recently in history that anyone thought it was a good idea to group a bunch of youngsters of the same age together. Avoiding the problems associated with teen years requires a healthy continuum from childhood to adulthood. And that be uh, means becoming more and more exposed to adult cultures and responsibilities as you go through your teen years. Now, grouping students by age destroys that continuum. In Teen 2.0, Epstein says that teens in cultures with an intact continuum have few of the teen angst issues common in the U.S. Teens also spent as low as five hours per week with peers of the same age in these societies. In the USA, teens spend 70 hours per week with people of their same age. 
So it's not surprising that virtually everything our teens think and care about has to do with their peers. Because of laws that restrict their ability to work and requiring schooling, they're trapped with their peers most of the day. Now this also gives marketers the opportunity to market to the teen culture which would not naturally exist without the artificial age segregation encouraged by schools and laws. And yeah, this has been a slow progression that this has been coming. And yeah, it started and it's gradually gotten to this point and we're going to have to back it up. As in not, not propping it up, but back it off a bit, like a bunch a bit. Now, this teen culture further infantilizes teens and holds them back by giving them terrible examples to emulate. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking uh, Hannah Montana. Ugh, my grandkids were not allowed to watch that. Not at my house. And their mama didn't like it neither. If they saw it at someone else's house, that was one thing. But at home, they were not allowed to watch that shit. Um, it's better to get them away from the peer group in public schools. They should be exposed to working adults who could teach them something useful. Plus, teens can be given responsibility for younger ho um, homeschooled children, which will benefit both the younger child and the teen. Yeah. Teaches them how to explain things to someone that just plain doesn't get it yet. It teaches them how to have be more compassionate towards each other and understanding. Now, number five is gets them away from school violence. It's not just crazy gunmen students are left defenseless against. Some schools put cops in the school, which sounds like a good idea. But if they aren't stopping school shootings, they are generally handcuffing non-resistant elementary school students. Other resource officers assault the students or tase them while the principal holds them down. Uh, th yeah, and these are there's links for all of this. And the administrations can't address the real issues because they are too busy interrogating five-year-olds until they pee their pants. Every day in the news, you see another report of a teacher doing something crazy, assaulting or sexually abusing students. And then there is the bullying, harassment, and violence from other students. The suicide rate for teenage girls is at an all-time high. And student, student suicides cluster around the beginning of the school year in the fall and final exams in the spring. This unneeded stress is killing our youth. I keep seeing flashings. What the heck? Okay. In, out, in, out, in, out. Some people must be having problems. Okay. Number six, stop wasting so much time. Attending K-12, 180 days per year for an average of 6 hours per day means a student spends 14,040 hours of their youth in public education system. It's a staggering 18.5% of waking hours young people spend in compulsory government institution. And that's not counting homework, extracurriculars, or detention. And what most people have to show for it, well, do you remember how to perform chemistry equations to calculate joules? I don't. I didn't take chemistry. Even if you did, is that a useful skill for more than a very specific segment of the population? I dream of what I could accomplish with 14,000 hours. I cringe thinking of all of the valuable things I could have learned. Or just the enjoyable time I could have spent doing whatever I loved. It's a matter or it's a much better use of time to let children and teens do what they want, whatever interests them. That's how Leonardo da Vinci started his training to become one of the greatest minds in history. Robert Greene explains in his book Mastery 
and banned from school because he was a bastard, Leonardo wandered the forests and he took parchment and pencils from his father and drew everything that interested him in intricate detail. This later led him to art school, which led him to the detailed study of bird's wings, which fueled his obsession with designing flying machines. So don't stifle your future da Vinci's. Empower them. There are actually so many other reasons to homeschool your kids, so please add more in the comments. And yeah, I'm sure you're convinced and you want to homeschool your kids, but what if it just isn't possible with your living and working situation? Well, there is another article coming up right after this one. Um, well, it probably came out today because this one was from yesterday where they tackle some creative ways to make homeschooling or unschooling work for you. And you don't have to play by the rules of corrupt politicians, manipulative media, and brainwashed peers. So when you just subscribe to the Daily Bell, you will also get a free guide on how to craft a two-year plan to reclaim three specific freedoms. And that guide shows you how to exactly to plan your next two years to build a free life of your dreams. It's not as hard as you think. Identify, plan, execute. There you go. Joe Jarvis is the one that wrote this over on the Daily Bell. So, I'm going to have to send this to my children. Actually, a lot of people don't realize that if you don't have people, both parents working outside of the home, if you don't have yourself so damn far in debt that you both have to work outside the home, if one of you cuts back, one of you stays home with the kids, think of how much less you're spending on, um, you know, gasoline or just automobile expenses or traveling expenses period to get you back and forth to work what you're not having to spend on um, getting you know to for food um, what you're not having to spend with enrolling your kids in school and all of this all the paraphernalia that you got to buy those school lists you know all that other fun shit you would be surprised how easy it would be to just cut back to just one income so one parent could stay home and work with the kids on this level. You'd really be surprised. I've got I've got family members that are doing this. And it's awesome. Um Let's put this over here as well. Oh, that's a beautiful picture, Becky. Hi, Bobby. I see you over here on realliberty.org. Okay. Uh, let's move along to my pocket again because I do have I do believe oh it is that time isn't it let me go check this check out the pig pigazette.com where hambo and porcus reside their word of the day for today is a progtard. It's a backstabbing, neo-Marxist, America-hating scumbag who is determined to make you as miserable as they are. Wow, that's really sad. In the quotable quotes section, we are fast approaching the stage of the ultimate inversion, the stage where the government is free to do anything it pleases while the citizens may only act by permission which is the stage of the darkest periods of human history, the stage of rule by brute force. That is from Ayn Rand. Yeah, we're there. In the Tasty Tidbits section, Twas the night before elections. Oh, shall we? I think we shall. 
"'Twas the night before elections and all through the town. Tempers were flaring, emotions were up and down. I in my bathrobe with cat in my lap had shut off the TV, tired of political crap. When all of the sudden there arose such a noise, I peered out my window, saw Pelosi and her boys. They had come from my wallet, they wanted my pay, to hand out to others who had not worked a day. They snatched up my money and, quick as a wink, jumped back on their bandwagon as I gagged from the stink. She then rallied her henchmen who were pulling her cart. I could tell they were out to tear my country apart. On Fanny, on Freddy, on Schumer and Feinstein, on Booker and Waters, she screamed at the pairs. They took off for her cause as they flew out of sight. I heard her laugh at Americans who wouldn't stand up and fight. So, I leave you to think on this one final note. If you don't want socialism, get out and vote. As if your vote matters. I added that last little bit. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so this date in history, the 2nd of November, 1917, Brit Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour proclaims intentions of carving up Ottoman Empire after World War I and establishing a homeland for Jews in Palestine. Yes, World War I, not two. This date in history, November the 2nd, 1948, beating the odds and making monkeys out of know-it-all pollsters and newspapers, Harry S., the buck stops here, Truman, beats Dewey. And that was not necessarily a good thing. Just from some of the things I've read about good old Harry S. And lastly, the 2nd of November, 1976, rational adults cringe in abject horror after a quivering tub of southern fried jello named Jimmy Carter wins Oval Office Derby against or in a race against Gerald Ford. Well, it was the lesser of two weevils. Not evils, weevils, because they're both little bugs and they take all the nutrient out of whatever they attack. So, thank you guys over on PIGazette.com. Hambo and Porkus, come on over there. Tell them, hey. Tell them Grammy sent you. Watch them run away. They will squeal. (laughs) Now, I'm going to go back to my pocket because I do have a couple more that I want to get to. This one is from FastCompany.com. It's from October the 29th of this year. Secrets of people who stay happy in the worst circumstances. So in the face of setbacks, some people seem to fall apart, while others find ways to move forward and continue to get things done. Are there things that you can do to be more resilient? I say, yes, there are. Now, bad things happen both personally and professionally. Relationships end. Significant others get sick or die. Promotions are given to someone else. Clients leave. Companies go through rounds of layoffs. Now, in the face of these setbacks, some people seem to fall apart, while others find ways to move forward and to continue to get things done. So, do you think there's things you can do to be more resilient? Well, the answer is, yeah to a point. Now first, bear in mind that resilience does not mean ignoring the negative feelings that come along with a tough time. Significant personnel or professional losses will lead to feelings of sadness and disappointment. It is natural to grieve about these losses and it's important to give yourself some time and space to do so. You're not obliged to go through all five stages of grief, but you shouldn't feel guilty if you do experience sadness or anger before you come to accept what has happened. Now, second, P. 
people seem to have a happiness set point. Generally speaking, in the weeks and months after a significant positive or negative life event, you tend to return to roughly a level of happiness that you had before that event. Doesn't mean that events can't have a long-term influence on how happy you are. Just that the best predictor of how happy you will be several months after a big positive or negative event is how happy you were before it. Third, there are times when negative feelings are the best way forward from a negative event. In particular, stress and anxiety are the natural reaction to a threat in the environment. If their reality is a calamity, or yeah, if, if their reality, whoa, that's the wrong there, honey. <laughs> if it's a calamity out there that you're trying to ward off, anxiety might be the right response. Um, one thing that happens when you're anxious is that you tend to ruminate over the cause of the anxiety. And rumination is a repeated cycle of thoughts. So if there is a potential th uh, threat, then thinking it through carefully may allow you to develop a plan to move forward that will help you to handle the situation. It may not be enjoyable to experience this level of stress, but it still may be useful. Now that said, there are several things that you can do to help cope with the bad times. Understand that you can control or that you can control or what you can control and what you can't, which yeah, that, that's a biggie. The first is to be clear about what factors are under your control. And that's a, quite a bit of work. And it shows when times are bad, people are more resilient when they focus on things that they can do to move forward rather than focusing on the way that circumstances have conspired to put them in a bind. Focus on actions you can take that will make your situation better. As you engage in those actions, you will find that you feel better about your work and will also be more productive. Also, surround yourself with people even if you don't feel like it. Yeah, you got to engage with other people. When you're sad or stressed, you often don't want to be around others. But there are several advantages to social engagement. When you talk about what is making you sad or anxious, you often find that other people have had similar experiences that they can share. Sadness can make you feel as though your situation is unique. So knowing that you're not the only one going through something can be valuable. In addition, social connection is motivating and can help you focus on tasks that need to be done. Also, look for an easy win, which for me, that's set an easy goal, you know? Oh, just get out of bed today. Get dressed today. Those are, sometimes those aren't, they seem easy goals to a lot of people, but there's some people that have a hard time with those. So, when you experience a loss in one aspect of your life, it can make you focus on the negatives across all the facets of your existence. That is not a good time to embark on a long project that may not succeed. Instead, find something in your work life that you can complete quickly and successfully. That way you can remind yourself that a significant setback is not a sign that you are cursed. Now, give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Go out of your way to give a positive interpretation of the actions of others. When you're angry about something at work, you tend to find reasons why other people are an obstacle to your success. This is particularly true when you're passed over for something you wanted. Well... Um, 
Recognize that most people you work with are potential allies. Just because someone was not able to give you something you wanted does not mean that everyone is out to get you. Unless you're like one of those snowflakey people. You're just a big old meanie poo-poo head. So, when you think negative thoughts about other people, you can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Your negative thoughts will influence the interpretation that you give to their actions that can cause you to interact with them with anger or mistrust. They will notice your attitude and treat you accordingly. Similarly, when you interpret their actions of other people positively, you are more likely to create good interactions with others. Basically what I was saying earlier in the chat. The vibe that you put out is what you get back. For the most part, that is very, very true. Now, these strategies will help you to minimize the influence of bad events on your life, and they will also help you feel better, because each success you have will boost your attitude toward the future. So, thank you for that one, and yeah... I have, I mean, I've always been a pretty happy person, but <clears throat> I have definitely become more so looking for, you know, the blessing, even if it's a mixed blessing or if it's just tough love, you know, I'll look for those things because sometimes that's what you, that's what you need right there. You know, especially if things have been just a little bit on the rough-ish side. Look for that lesson in there. And possibly that's enough to get you past that grumble, grumble, growl, or total pissed off, or totally bummed out, or whatever. You see a lesson and you go, wow, okay, now what can I do to not have to have a repeat of this? And you give yourself little tasks to do. That's what I do. You know, and, I, and I'm, I've stayed pretty happy for the most part. Every once in a while, I have a bummer dudette day. But it's really not even a bummer dudette day. It's just basically a few minutes of bummer dudette in a day. And then I do something to snap out of it because I don't like being a bummer dudette. I really don't. I much prefer being carefree and happy-go-lucky. So, it makes everybody else around me a little bit happier, too. If you share a smile, you can't help but have one on your face. Just saying. So, um, did I put that over here? No, I did not. So... Okay, okay, yeah, find the silver lining. By the way, what are silver prices these days? I'm sure I'm losing my ass, although I still have my silver, but I'm sure it's less than what I paid for it several years ago. <laughs> Not that I purchased it in order to sell it right away anyway, but yeah. Okay, let's see. There it is. Yeah, I put all kinds of shit in my pocket the other day, and it's like, wow. Okay. Um, okay, where do I want to go? Do I want to go to the time traveler, or do I want to go to the, my grandfather? Let me see what this one is. See how long it is. Oh my God, it's really long. <laughs> I won't do that one. I'll save it for later because I don't have that much time left. So, um, see how long that one is. Uh, hmm. Nope. I'm. I'm. Mm, yeah. 
How about we go here? This is from theinquisitor.com. Do a little freaky deaky for you. Time traveler who claims that he visited the year 8,973 passes lie detector test. And the good news is the future is apparently a delightful utopia. Now, <clears throat> Tim Butters wrote this. A man who claims he was sent by the British government to the future where immortal human cyborgs rule has passed a lie, lie detector test. Immortal human cyborgs. Oh, that doesn't sound pleasant. Now, the Mirror reports that William Taylor claims that he was part of a project funded by the British government which saw him spend six hours in the year 8,973. Now, on his jolly jaunt into realms unknown, William encountered all manner of fancy things, including telepathic robot-human hybrids who live forever. In a secret project that he claimed was sponsored by the British government, Taylor was fast-tracked forward a few thousand years to see what was what. And despite apocalyptic predictions about the future of planet Earth, Taylor said it was an, a utopia that he didn't want to leave. Apparently, there was no crime, conflict, poverty, or disease, and there was a cure for every problem. The inhabitants of this perfect paradise were cyborg-like residents, and although Taylor claims they looked somewhat freaky to our sensibilities, these future creatures had hearts of gold. Okay, you were there for how many hours? I, the six hours. I'm thinking the Rod Serling thing, how to serve human, comes to mind. <laughs> the cyborgs had abnormally large heads and eyes, but small mouths. Now, here's the best part. They were all immortal. I don't know that that would necessarily be a best part. Now, Taylor believes that the alien-like creatures were direct descendants of human beings, and although they communicated through telepathy, they could also speak to Taylor in, in, in the English tongue. Hmm. Now, Taylor claims the technology which enables time travel has been in existence since 1981. He now believes that he has a moral responsibility to build awareness about the very tangible reality of traveling through time. He said the public has a right to know that by the year 2028, we will all be hopping around in time and space, unhindered by the standard and established laws of physics. Taylor himself claimed to have visited the future before, and he said he used a cylindrical time machine to visit the year 3000. Apparently, life in 3000 wasn't as rosy as it was in 8973. He said, I didn't want to be there too long. There was a red sky and pollution was everywhere. I realized there was radiation in the air, so I had to leave quickly. Now, you may scoff at his outlandish claims, but all his stories have passed the lie detector test carried out by Apex TV with honors. And who knows, in 10 years' time, we might all be living a timeless existence. Well, well, I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, shit, 1470? Yeah. Yeah. I've lost about $6 an ounce. <laughs> good thing I'm just holding on to it. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Oh, well, it's still pretty. And I actually, I don't have like stock market silver. I have actual have tangible silver. So, yeah. Okay. Kind of hard to lose your ass when you still have the asset, correct? correct. And the money was already spent. And it's not like I'm going to be selling it anytime in the near future. Not, don't have plans to do that. So, eh. Eh. I guess. My silver lining is I still have it. So, there you go. We'll just do this. 
I don't know that a cyborgian reality sounds like... That does not sound like a good time. I'm wondering how in the hell if it's... If, 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 if. Really big word for only two letters. Um, mm, yeah. Not really interested in that kind of future. Good thing I'm not going to have to worry about it, huh? I don't plan on being here for another 8,000 years. <laughs> or 7,000. Or 6,000, for that matter. So, yeah. Moving along. Back to my pocket. Strangeness. Um, okay, I've done that one, done that one, done that one. Huh. Do I want to? No. Let's go check out the recommended in my pocket, just because. <laughs> okay, I got to do this. I got to. From my pocket recommended. BusinessInsider.com Vatican releases its own Pokemon Go app that lets you chase Jesus, and it's just as unbelievable as it sounds. Oh my god. Yeah. I don't think so. Are you seriously not going to let me read it? You sons of bitches, because I have an ad blocker. Fuck you, Captain Assholio. Um, shit. There. There. Are you happy now? Sons of bitches, Captain Assholio. Okay, so. Um,. Apparently, the Vatican has released a game called Follow JC Go, and it's based on the augmented reality game Pokemon Go. But rather than chasing Pikachu and Squirtle, the Vatican version involves collecting saints and other biblical fi uh, figures. Wow. I'm thinking that's a massive, uh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> Now, once players catch them all, their spiritual squad becomes an evangelized team that follows Jesus together. Players have to keep track of their avatar's nutrition, hydration, and prayer count by collecting special objects, saying prayers for the sick, and going into a church whenever they pass one. And the game is available for both um, Apple and Android, although only in Italy and Spain for the moment. Oh, darn. Darn. So when a legacy brand tie, uh, tries to stay hip and relevant with young people, the result often looks like um, Steve Buscemi's How Do You Do or How Do You Do Fellow Kids meme. Okay, whatever. But the latest version is more like, how do you do fellow Catholics? Yes, the Vatican is now trying to get in touch with millennials by releasing the game Follow JC Go. <sighs> now, once players apparently... Okay, wait a minute. Uh, rather than chasing Pikachu and Squirtle, the Vatican version involves collecting saints and other biblical feature figures by answering philosophical questions about them. One hypothetical query on the app's website is, Who said, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The hint, it was Jesus. Oh my God, it's going to be a tough one. Now, once players catch them all using geolocation, their spiritual squad becomes an evangelization team that follows Jesus. Have you found Jesus? I'm looking for Jesus. I didn't know Jesus was lost. 
Apparently, players have to keep track of their avatar's nutrition, hydration, yada yada, player count, blah 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 blah, by collecting all these special objects, saying prayers for the sick in hospitals, and going to churches whenever they pass one. Yada yada yada, blah blah blah. Apparently, it took, or it cost five hundred thousand dollars, and took two years and thirty-two thousand hours to develop. Wow. Pope Francis is reportedly a fan of the game, which isn't a shock. Yeah, whatever. And the Catholic Church also needs all the help it can get when it comes to the millennials, because almost 20% of the people who leave the Catholic Church are under the age of 25. And issues such as ongoing abuse scandal have deterred them from coming back. So, mm, I'm thinking no go with Pokemon Go or JC Go. I'm just not going to go there, but I'll go ahead and share this with y'all. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 10. Later, Grimner and Moosker will be on with the Freaker's Ball. Tomorrow, noon, Eastern Time, will be Flash of Rooney Dork. Um doing the dork table Sunday at noon Grimmy will be playing the blues here on the RLM and he's going to be leading you into Hal Anthony who's going to open up a can of whoop ass on yo ass behind the woodshed I will be back on Wednesday for the wackadoodle Wednesday edition of the rocket chair but until then I hope y'all have an absolutely amazing weekend let the weakness end. They're casting a spell. They're, it's a weak end. End of weakness. So have, an, have a wonderful end of weakness. Please don't say good morning to people because you're not in mourning. Say good day. Happy day. Whatever. Just don't, don't tell people good morning because you don't want people to be in mourning. In any case, I'm going to be out of here. Please remember... I really do love you all, and I wish you all enough. Good night. <laughs>